these gentlemen actually need no introduction. Um, Dr. Jacks, I've spoken to both of them on the phone, and I've had fascinating conversations uh, so far. Um, other than the book, which incidentally has been updated in 2012, is now close to 900 pages, is that right? <laughs> and st still growing. And still growing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, he is also, incidentally, if people uh, don't remember, don't know, until about 91, I think, the editor of uh, uh, Marxism Today, which is the, uh, the mouthpiece of uh, the Communist Party of Great Britain. So, interesting here. And uh, Sashi, if you recall, about a year ago, um, woke a lot of people up at the Oxford Union with his speech, <laughs> calling for, among other things, Britain, <laughs> suggesting that Britain repay India for 200 years of colonialism, even if it were, what, a pound person? A symbolic pound a year, yeah. Indeed. Okay, so uh, both uh, experts in, in their fields, also gadflies, I guess would be a good way to describe them as well. Sashi, let me start with you and bounce this idea off. Martin's book, When China Rules the World, let me ask you, really? Do you believe that? <laughs> well, Martin said, of course, that he didn't want us to take the title literally. So we'll assume it's sort of China ruling the world like Britannia rules the waves, now Britannia waves the rules, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a largely uh, metaphorical expression. But I think we're heading for a world that no one's going to rule. Okay. I think we have very clearly entered a post-superpower world. The unipolar moment so beloved of Washington theorists is passing. It has already passed, in my view. I think that we will no longer have countries being able to do what the U.S. has so credibly been able to do for the last half century, which is to influence events half a globe away, uh, even conducting military actions far away from their homeland, uh, affecting the fates of governments, changing governments in foreign countries. That kind of ruling the world, no one's going to be able to do it. The world has moved on. So the whole way no we're one pitching, may want to do it either. So the whole way we're pitching this uh, argument or debate, China versus India, is actually, A, not very useful, and B, also irrelevant, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, that's, no? that's harsh on our organizers. It's an interesting question, but I agree with you, not a particularly useful one. For two reasons. First of all, I think that, um, I mean, that lovely little drawing they had of this cup, this trophy yes. being, you know, tugged, uh, there isn't a trophy. I mean, frankly, what we're looking for, I think, is to see both countries doing well by their people and thereby indirectly by the world. Uh, but secondly, if you even were to see a tug of war, that rope is so much over on the Chinese side that there, there really isn't a race anymore. It was a question one could have asked in, say, 76 to 78, when both countries had the same GDP, which meant in per capita terms, India was actually slightly ahead. Whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. So, so what you're saying is, if, if it were still considered a race, if the outcome is ago. already predetermined? Yeah, except that it's a race that I'm not keen on entering into. Okay. Uh, and I just don't think it's, it's any more the same race. All right. I mean, the question was asked a lot in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, and it was legitimate to ask. It was asked very much in the context of democratic mixed economy development versus communist development. But the terms of, of the debate have changed completely. China is no longer, as I was saying to Martin a little earlier, a communist country in any meaningful sense of the term, certainly in economics. It does not follow communist economics. Um, and in any case, by 78, it started a process of liberalization, which took its economy growing much faster than India. And thanks to the magic of compounding, it's gone from being an economy on a par with India to being an economy about five times the size of India. It's absurd for us to think in terms of a race or a competition. Okay. But I ask myself, why should I want to compete with China? As long as my people are not starving, they can have three meals a day, decent work, better quality of life. Let the Chinese people have it too. We're not in a race against each other. We're in mm. a race for the same things. Mm. Interesting. Okay, Dr. Jacques, let me bring you in, or Martin, rather. You know, one of the premises of your book is, uh, I mean, when China rules the world, is at some stage, it's a question more of uh, when, as opposed to if, China will overtake the United States to become the biggest economy in the world, number one. Correct? All right. Let me ask you now, though, with... What's, what China's been going through the last two, three years, the slowdown, where it's about this debt bomb, where it's about the rebalancing, um, where it's about corruption as well, does that 
push the time frame out further? I mean, is there a number that you use when China will overtake the U.S.? Or is that even useful anymore, asking that? Well, I've always resisted putting a date because, you know, it, 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 it's silly. It's not being serious. Uh, what's already we know is, according to the World Bank International Comparison Program, China overtook the size of the American economy by GDP, PPP, uh, towards the end of 2014. That's what we know okay. in terms of a reasonably, well, objective assessment. But China is still behind the United States, significantly so, by GDP measured by exchange rates. But as and John, per capita, and per, by per capita, uh, Chinese living standards are less than a quarter of those of the United States. So to close that gap, we're talking about decades. We're not talking about in the near future. Mm. In terms of GDP by exchange rates, then I think. Uh, China will overtake the United States within the next few years. Mm. Um, and I think that's inevitable. I agreed with John Negroponte this morning. He said, you know, it's, it will happen. It's the, it's the figures. Okay. Uh, and so, but that in itself, it's not just about economics, is it? I mean, to become the hegemonic power or whatever you want to call it, I'll resi I, then <clears throat> you're talking about a range of metrics, political influence, uh, cultural influence. Frankly, let me ask you, does that include military? N not yet, but I'm about to say military. Okay. Ethical power, intellectual power. I mean, sometimes we use the term soft power to express some of this as well. Um, now, in those terms, that's much more difficult to measure because you can't have any really hard figures in relationship to this. Uh, and I think this takes time. This mm. takes a lot of time. You know, when Britain rose to be the most important, number one country in the early 19th century, um, it was still a long time before it became that sort of military, mainly naval, uh, political, cultural power that it did become in the second half of the 19th century. Likewise, the United States. The United States became the world's largest wouldn't, economy. Wouldn't it happen much faster today with China, though? Yes, I think you have a point. Okay. Yes. I mean, just, just on the United States. The United States was the largest economy in the world before the end of the 19th century. But we don't start talking about America as a global power until after 1945, really, but some elements of it in the 1930s. Now, true, it'll happen quicker. Why will it happen quicker? Well, partly because everything speeded up, partly because the growth rates we're talking about now are much faster, and partly because China is so big. Mm -hmm. And that's also potentially the possibility for India as well. Interesting. So the, the other premise of your book in terms of dominance, right, uh, uh, reflects Chinese economic power as well as cultural power. But I, I noticed that even though we're talking about it today, you didn't talk so much about it in your book the military side of things. And let me turn to Sashi uh, for that. From India's perspective, or maybe even your own personal perspective, how much does India fear China's resurgence? Well, we have the world's longest unresolved frontier between us, and that dispute is one that for some decades we've been under the impression China doesn't want to settle. They seem to enjoy keeping it slightly alive so they can throw India off balance once in a while. I'm not sure fear is the word, though, because increasingly uh, there's also been a perception that it can't be in the interests of anybody in China to go to war over that border again, as China did very successfully in 1962. Uh, and the lingering legacy of 62 in India is one not so much of fear, but of humiliation, frankly. We got clobbered. Uh, whereas in China, I think it's indifference. I think the Chinese have forgotten it. No, they don't even remember, most of them, that they went to war with us. So there is this, this difference of perception. Um, I was, before, I, I would like to come to this further, but I want to quickly interject the one soft power. That's the one area where I disagree with Martin. I don't think that, in fact, China is doing well on soft power, despite assiduous efforts to promote it. Everything from the Beijing Olympics to the hundreds of Confucius centers around the world are an assiduous attempt to promote Chinese soft power. 
But unfortunately, soft power isn't only what governments can promote through propaganda. It's what the world sees of you as what you are. And, uh, and that's why a country like India, where the government is incompetent at promoting soft power, has so much more soft power because of Bollywood films and the practice of yoga and Ayurveda and so on, which have nothing to do with the government, but which actually make India look like the attractive culture and civilization that oh, it is. Okay. Now, coming back to China for a minute, um, look what happened in Beijing. I've often, often used this example uh, uh, as, as to what China's challenge is in this context. They have this wonderful, beautifully organized Olympics. Everyone's coming from around the, around the world full of admiration for the way they've constructed the village, the infrastructure, the reception facilities for everybody, the games village, the works, right? But journalists coming in advance the Olympics start writing about repression and lack of human rights. So the Chinese quickly announce that they've designated six or seven spots where anybody can stand up and say whatever they like, sort of like Hyde Park Corner anything they like against the government. But to do so, they had to apply for a permit. Well, every single person who applied for a permit promptly got arrested. And so this device, instead of becoming an exercise in promoting soft power, became actually a tool for the police to identify potential troublemakers without having to go to the trouble and expense of looking for them. Mm. But it grossly undermined Chinese soft power when people in the Western media and other countries' media wrote about this entire fiasco. It, it, so this is, you can't, it seems to me, claim soft power on the one hand and run a politically repressive system on the other. And that remains China's fundamental flaw before it tries to become a cultural paragon for the world. So the, the cack handedness that you talk about in the Olympics, that was a few years ago. But Martin, I want to ask you this in terms of China potentially shooting itself in the foot. And I risk here angering a number of different nationalities. So. I apologize beforehand. I mean, in the 50s, 60s, we had the, the stereotype of the ugly American. We had the Japanese in the 80s. Even Singapore went through a phase, reached a certain per capita level of income, uh, basic needs met, disposable income, let's go travel and see more outside our own shores. The Chinese are doing that in droves. And when you think about 1.3 million people, the Japanese wave ended, right? When you think about 1.3 million people, this could go on for years. And let's be frank, I mean, there are a number of people, a number of countries who, while they like the Chinese tourist dollar, don't necessarily enjoy the behavior of tourists when they pass through their country. China's not doing itself any favors on that front, is it? Well, I think you've got to think about it like this. China has emerged very recently out of extreme poverty. Initially, the Chinese tourists who went abroad were those who were better off. You know, middle class jobs, professional jobs, and so on. But such has been the economic success of China that now, you know, wages have been rising at the same speed as economic growth. So now it's possible for people from, you know, relatively speaking, um, the hinterland of China and so on, to go on holiday abroad. And they have had no contact at all, really, with the outside world in terms of physical contact with the outside world. So they bring with them the customs of the Chinese people, just like anyone else would. And, I mean, actually the Chinese government have been uh, concerned about this because of giving the Chinese a bad reputation. But I think we should understand it, not in those terms, I think we should understand it as what happens to a poor people when they have the opportunities which previously were only available to those who are much better off. Um, and, you know, th that will change over time. But before you get... But, but what is China's but, but, equivalent but, 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 but of it's yoga not, it's, it's or, not, or Bollywood? But it's not even, it's not just a problem for the Chinese, is it? I mean, you think of Western tourists in many countries. No, in many developing countries. Yeah. I am embarrassed by their behavior. No, I, I personally believe it's sort of a developmental thing, right? Yeah. And several countries have had their phases, have gone through phases, but now it's China's turn and it is raising, they are raising a lot of eyebrows is, is all I'm saying. But it, it, does China have an equivalent to, let's say, yoga or Bollywood, if you're talking about cultural, exporting their culture and cultural dominance? Well, I, I, I partly agree with what Shashi says about uh, 
the problem. I mean, the difficulty with the way the Chinese interpret their cultural influence is it's easily conceived in their mind as state-led. Okay, but of course, as time goes by, we shouldn't think of it in those terms because China is a very rich civilization, 2,000 years old, the longest conti continuously existing polity in the world, extremely rich. Going back, many great thinkers, of course, the one we all know of is Confucius. I notice now, though there's a book come out, which is called, I th I, uh, the title, uh, I've got them, just bought the thing, but I should remember the title, The Way or something, by uh, a couple of people, a uh, uh, Chinese and a, and, a, and a Westerner at Harvard. And this has become immediately a bestseller, top of the charts in the States and uh, in, in, in my own country. Mm. There is a growing interest in these kind, you know, well, how can we understand the Chinese? What have they got to offer us? And so on. And I think that we'll see this uh, in a major way. A completely different uh, example of this is China as an example to the developing world. Do you remember the Washington Consensus? Well, it was buried some time ago of no relevance and it was useless. What's replaced it? Essentially, in terms of influence, the Chinese developmental, developmental model. The idea of pragmatism, the idea of the market and the state, the idea of special economic zones, that kind of thinking, which is very Chinese in a certain kind of way, because whereas Western thinking tends to be binary, Chinese thinking is more about hybridity, and this kind of thinking is influencing many countries in the developing world. So there are ways in, and I would call that, a, if you want to use the term soft power, I'm not a great fan of it, but, but, it, but I know it's getting at something important. I think that is an example of China's soft power. <coughs> okay, and uh, the one way it could be uh, uh, dominant in, in that set. Sashi, when you take a look at comparative advantages, disadvantages on the advantages side of the ledger, right? Democracy, India, messy though it can be, as I'm sure you know, but still a democracy. To the demographics, very much favor India. Average age, what is it? 20, I think 27. 27 20, right now. It's going up old. slowly, but nothing as fast as China's. Uh, S before we get, I, I think I know where you're going. Okay. But but before you go to democracy and demography, and I'm happy to address them, I did want to come back on this business of the Chinese model of development because it's ah. actually not true, Martin. I have spoken to so many African heads of state and government and foreign ministers in the last 10 or 15 years. They admire China. They're grateful to China for the generosity of Chinese aid. But they do not think the Chinese model is replicable in their societies. They look on it as something in many ways impressive and awe-inspiring, but utterly foreign to but them. Not for they them. cannot be China, they cannot try to be like China. They look at India and they say, now there's a mess just like us. They have the same <laughs> sorts of problems, they have the poverty, they have the, uh, uh, the divisions, we may have clans, they may have castes. If they can triumph over these problems, we can learn from them. Uh -huh. This is the message of getting kids. They don't believe they can learn from China. I'm, I don't agree with Martin. You're a uh, I, I, the the point I'd like to emphasize is that the Chinese never consider themselves to be a model. Because the way the Chinese think is that they are always different. Chinese civilization is di very distinct. So therefore, they don't have the kind of evangelist or missionary thinking of the West, of the Americans, you know, will be like us. Our constitution is a model for your, for your political arrangements and so on. The Chinese don't think like that. So, it's important to recognize that the Chinese are not, don't have an idea of exporting their model. What I mean by that, and you know, you're, off, you're right, in some countries it's not been relevant, but the, the, the countries, if they're looking for an example, look at China and think, well, is there anything that this can offer us? Okay, now we can come back to democracy and democracy. <laughs> so I was going to say, I mean, on the plus side of the ledger, demographics plus system of government, democracy. China, though, is just simply scale, the size of the place, number of people, etc. Plus their system, like it or not, they get things done. And you sure. say what? And look, in between 1981 and 2011, the Chinese pulled 753 million people out from below their poverty line. If you took it at $1.90 a day, that's how many people crossed above that line. Mm. We have done, at best, and not for the whole 30 years, for about 15 years, 
we've done about 10 million people a year, so 150 million people, smaller numbers in other years, so maybe we'll get to about 250 in the same time China got to 750. So we know the Chinese have done well, and I'm not knocking that. But just two or three cautionary notes, and I will mention democracy and demography. The first is the wariness about our linear projections, including Martin's. Because the fact is, I, mean, I went to graduate school in the States in the 70s, and subsequently in the 80s, I saw all these bestsellers with titles like Japan as number one. Yes. What happened? Yeah. Where did Japan take over the world? Do you remember those leaked CIA reports from 1976, 78? There were hearings held in the American House of Congress saying the Soviet Union was going to outstrip America by every yardstick and take over the world. People have been wrong in the past. And assuming that as circumstances change, that you can just continue saying, well, China used to grow at 9% compounded, now it'll grow at 7% compounded. It doesn't work that way. First of all, those percentages are being questioned every year. You may remember this year the target was supposed to be 7%. The Chinese have knocked it down to a range of between 6.5 to 7. The IMF says 6.3. And the IMF says next year will be 6 and it'll stay below that for five years. So already the numbers and projections are being questioned by international authorities. And then, you know, when the fundamentals change, the, the linear projection becomes fallible. So if, for example, China is going to go through a massive structural change, into becoming a more domestic consumption-driven economy, which looks like it's necessary, you may not have this kind of growth figure anymore. Mm. Democracy, why is democracy relevant? India is, is messy. I mean, I, uh, you know, the Chinese want, they went from zero kilometers of six-lane expressways in 1996 to 150,000 kilometers of six-lane expressways in 2016, 10 years. Mm. And they did it basically by drawing a line on the map and bulldozing anything in the past. Doesn't matter if it was a village, if it was an ancient cemetery, whatever, nothing. They did it, and they've created this magnificent infrastructure. In India, our entire national highway network is 92,000. Most of them are four lane. Some of them are two lane, that they call national highways. We hardly have any six lane expressways. And if you want to widen a two lane road in India, you will have protesters, you will have people refusing to sell you their land, they'll be going to court over compensation entitlements, the leftist parties will show up with red flags and, and hold dharnas and objections, <laughs> Bollywood stars will come and conduct hunger strikes, your road is not going to get widened for four years. And that's simply the way we are in India, right? And you so still there would have the permit comparison. Raj as well. Now that's, that's on one side of it. However, it does mean that when change comes, everyone has been eventually brought along. It's been messy, untidy, it's been problematic, there's been dissent, but everyone comes along and the system moves. The liberalization of 1991 was a major paradigm shift. Mm. Since then, almost every single political party in the country, including one of the communist parties, has had a share in government, has been in one or the other government. Not one of them has reversed liberalization. China, what happens is it, everything is a top-down repressive system. The, it's like a limousine of states that's going on cruise control on a six-lane expressway. What happens if it suddenly hits an unexpected pothole? The axle might break. There are simply no bets as to what will happen uh, if suddenly the politics gets out of control, if there are, if there's serious dissent, if there's serious unrest politically. India, the system allows you to find ways out. The pressure cooker has a safety valve. In China, we're not sure there is one. So, okay, back to Martin on this issue then. The slowdown in China, right? Back in the day, and you remember this, uh, the magic number for China's economy was 8% GDP growth a year. That was the number. If they, were, if they managed to hit that number, they would be able to create enough jobs to absorb roughly about 10 million people a year entering the workforce, maintain social stability, keep themselves in power, right? Now that A, the economy is slowing down, B, the China workforce is actually shrinking because of demographics. What is the magic number? Is there one? I mean, obviously, they, they, they are, they're hitting it and doing at least better than that. Otherwise, we would see much more unrest than we do in China now. Well, I, I mean, you, you, you've sort of said it. I mean, China had to hit a certain growth rate in that earlier phase because they had to find the jobs for all the people leaving the countryside and coming to the cities. And that was a great pressure. But that pressure's gone, because basically um, migration from the countryside is now running at a very low level, and it will get smaller because of the demographic situation. So China doesn't need, to create, doesn't need a growth rate that they, ha they had before, 
for that reason anymore. So, so here's the thing, okay? The other thing people talk about with regards to China's economy is this whole rebalancing idea, right? I get kind of tired of seeing it every day, but less smokestack manufacturing, more new economy services, etc., right? Part of the success of that, if they're able to do it, will hinge on whether or not they're able to, this whole phrase, SOE reform, right? Which involves millions of workers potentially who could be redundant because that's all they've done their whole lives. They can't be retrained overnight to suddenly work in a, I don't know, a call center or, or an internet company. What happens then? Well, uh, you see, j just on this growth rate, to finish the point, that point off, I mean, <clears throat> we always knew that at a certain point, I mean, the Chinese said this, the Chinese are very, the Chinese are very honest and frank about their economic progress. That's why they're so good at it, because they don't bullshit. They get on with the job and they deliver. And they have always said that at some, you know, that as we develop, the growth rate will decline. And there have been many voices in China that have felt that actually it should have begun to happen a bit earlier. Because while they've been, had their foot on the accelerator in the way that they have, then there have been certain costs, environmental costs, uh, the, the difficulty of shifting the, the center of gravity. You let the later you, in, in, in terms of the economy, the later you leave it, the harder it becomes. The, the greater the danger that the fall in the growth rate will be that much greater or that much faster. So they've been very aware of this. Now, the, what, they want, what they are trying to do now is, as you say, to shift the nature of the economy. This is, what the, this is the great question now. Can they do it? If they don't do it, then they'll get stuck in the middle income trap because they will not be able to improve their labor. Is that the worst possible outcome, just getting stuck in the middle income trap? Or is well, it social instability? Because well, we're talking it, about millions of workers here at, at SOEs. The, the, if there's large-scale unemployment and they can't provide jobs for them, that would create a lot of social instability. Um, but if you look at what's happening, so it's a very complicated shift, and we shouldn't you know, we shouldn't play games with the shift because uh, for the ch the, the, we need the Chinese to succeed in this, you know, because China's now the most important economy in the world for the rest of us. So this is very important. The most important question is the shift from a uh, labor-intensive manufacturing economy to a knowledge-intensive value-added economy. This is the big question, to shift in, in, uh, from manufacturing to services. Now, on this front, the Chinese are doing well. They're ahead of what they themselves, their, their, their aim. But this is happening despite the government, though. No, no, the no, 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 it's not happening despite, despite the government. But the government's been extremely important in, the, in, the, in the, its macroeconomic measures in relationship to it. Tertiary sector, service sector, now accounts for over 50% of the Chinese economy, and manufacturing is down to 40%. So that is a big shift in a short space of time, something that actually will take 10 to 20 years, in my view, and it's happened quite quickly. The, what in the longer run, as a developed economy, they'd be aiming for around 65% uh, in the tertiary sector. Okay? So that is one area of success. Increasing consumption, they've been less successful. Uh, they, between 2010 and 2015, they only managed to increase consumption as a proportion of GDP from 36 to 38 percent. And they're trying to boost the nature, the, the size of the consumption market. Still saving uh, too much? Because exactly. there's still no social safety net? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Essentially, well, essentially, this is a saving society, a great savings culture. That is what they do. That's what they're used to okay, doing. Just very quickly, let me take the other side then. Should everything go according to plan, the way you see things happening in your book, let's say, China becomes the number one preeminent power in the world, overtakes the U.S., etc., starts becoming, a, uh, becoming a, a culturally dominant as well, starts to export that. Is all this going to happen? Does it assume that the Communist Party is going to still be in power or not? I have to ask you. Well, I mean, just say one other thing because Shashi raised it as well. And that is, we should presume the Chinese growth rate over time will continue to fall. Okay, so we got used to 10% up until around 2010, or even sometimes greater than that, but over 35 years, average of just under 10%. Now it's maybe 7%, maybe 6.5%, maybe 6%. I think the Chinese can sustain 5 to 6% over the next 20 years. 
because they've still got a large number of people in the countryside. They've still, you know, there's still lot parts of the economy well behind the more advanced areas. Five, six percent sustained is going to be able to, A, achieve social stability, keep them in power, yes, yeah. and deliver Well, well, well we've come, I'll come to the power question in a moment. Okay. And there, and, but then as China gets closer and closer to Western levels of development, the growth rate will decline down to two or three percent, in other words, to Western levels. So yes, what would be expected? So right? what yeah, but, I mean, there are still a couple of questions, Mart. I mean, first of all, there is the completely unpredictable issue of technological disruption, right? So you've got already in the Western world, you've got artificial intelligence systems coming up that are, are transforming. I mean, robotics technology in both America and Japan. China doesn't have much of a record of developing its own technologies. But there are technologies coming in that may start taking away jobs from China. And that will actually, the kinds of jobs that are being done in China now will suddenly find themselves going back to the West, not to be done by high-paid Westerners, but to be paid by unpaid, done by unpaid robots and, and machines and AI systems. Now, in those circumstances, for example, unless China has technology to offer, uh, how does it manage to, to, to squeeze an advantage? Second concern, 65% of Chinese growth has come from exports. Exports are going down as the West still uh, lumbers in recession, is unable to pull itself out of it. So you've really got to have a dramatic transformation of your domestic market arrangements in order to be able to drive growth through your own. I mean, in India, for example, some extraordinary percentage, it's slipping my mind at the moment, but certainly over 60% of India's GDP growth has come from Indians making and providing goods and services to other Indians. They've been essentially relatively less touched but what's happening in the external sector, mm. uh, which is the opposite of China's situation. And this is why, in some ways, China has a little more to worry about in the short term. We still haven't got to the uh, politics of it, because if you have unemployed people, and already there's the dem demography we haven't discussed, where one Chinese man is supporting four grandparents, uh, you don't have a, an efficient state social safety net. Um, if that one person supporting four grandparents becomes unemployed, What's going to happen in mm. China? If that, that's multiplied by a few tens of millions. Will you have unrest the system is able to cope with without that pressure cooker valve? Well, well there, are, there, are two, there have been two drivers of Chinese growth hitherto. One is investment, 45% even during the stimulus period, and the other has been exports. Now, they're bringing the investment rate down now because it's too high, because the problem with having such a high investment rate is one, contributing to corporate indebtedness, and secondly, undermining labor and capital productivity. So they need to bring that down, and they are bringing that down. Secondly, the other driver, as you say, Shiatsashi, is uh, exports. Now, uh, prior to the financial crisis, exports accounted for 35% of Chinese GDP. It's now roughly 24%, and I think that this is Probably, I don't know whether it will stay like this, but it certainly won't go b back up to what it was before. Um, and it's undesirable for all sorts of reasons for it to go back and forth. So the Chinese need to have new drivers for their growth. And the new drivers have to come from the new sources of technology and production. So, for example, um, and you're wrong, by the way, about the, the Chinese not being innovative. In lots of areas, they've become extremely innovative. And Examples? Well, in, for example, in the internet, I mean, uh, Alibaba is a, a very advanced expression. I mean, Alibaba is bigger than uh, Amazon and eBay put together. But it's a la la last year... The others aren't allowed to compete. I was going to say. Yeah. I was gonna say. Well, what about the 40,000 cyber uh, police employed by the Chinese? Uh, Alibaba is not a state uh, company. Internet is not exactly a free field. In Alibaba is a private company. No, no, but I'm, and Baidu is a private the company. The internet I mean, these, this is the, these, you're, you're saying there are no, no, no new sources of growth. These are the new sources of growth. 10% of Chinese retail last year was on the internet, and it's rising at 40% a year. So, and, and in many ways, uh, in many respects, in the big cities and so on, you know, China is extremely wired up, largest internet population in the world. So the question for the Chinese now is to find and develop these new drivers of growth. And I think that in terms of um, the structural shift, the early signs are promising, but it is at very early stages still. The signs in terms of increasing consumption are not so encouraging. For that, as you said earlier, they need to develop a, a much 
better safety net so people feel more confident in the future mm. and less that they need to save the money themselves. Mm. Now, the other question you were going to pushing me to answer was, well, what's going to happen politically? Yes, let's finally get to that. Okay, yeah. Now, I think that um, uh, for the, as far as one can see at the moment, the position of the Chinese Communist Party is very strong. Why? I mean, it's like governance in any part of the world. The Chinese Communist Party has presided over the greatest economic transformation in modern history and in human history, a most extraordinary change. People's lives and living standards right across China have been utterly transformed. So for that, the Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, enjoys uh, the support and the legitimacy of any political organization which presides over that kind of transformation. Now, 10 years down the road, maybe it won't look the same. Maybe they'll get into trouble over this transition. Maybe they will. Maybe it'll only be, you know, half successful. Or, and maybe the living standards will be affected. Maybe, you know, at the moment, they're produ last year, they created 11 million jobs. So they can still, so unemployment is very low in China. Uh, but maybe they'll run into more difficulty. I, I mean, I don't know, I haven't got a crystal ball. So, but I, know, I, I certainly recognize these changes are very difficult. But for the foreseeable future, the Chinese Communist Party, I think, is very secure. How far is the foreseeable And, and I'll, I'll say something else, and that is, political stability in China is not just an interest of the Chinese. It's also a global interest. What interest have we got in political, mass political instability and potential implosion in China? The impact of that globally would be far, far greater than what happened in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Why? Because China is now the, the second largest economy in the world, and the fallout from things going wrong on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an extremely uh, large scale would be disastrous globally. Let's be blunt. What you're talking about is if and when Xi Jinping does not have the military, the PLA, under his heel as he has done now, has been able to do by now. I, I, I think that, let, let's say, I mean, what, what, what's a scenario? A scenario would be growing dissatisfaction, growing instability, uh, large demonstrations, riots, then beginning to be divisions within the Communist Party at the higher levels and so on. I mean, I don't think this is at all likely. I, I, I'm not saying it will never happen, but in the next 10 years, 20 years, I think it's very, very unlikely. But, it, but the consequences, not only for China, but the world of this happening, would be very, very serious. Okay. All right. I agree with Martin on that, by the way. I think we all have, we all want to see China succeed. I hope we all want to see India succeed, and for comparable yeah. reasons. You don't want to see these big countries failing their people and thereby failing the world because instability will be chaotic. But my argument, going back to the very first question that video they asked, is why can't the two countries cooperate much more? I would like to see that blessed border issue settled because it's an unnecessary irritant. Now that she has and consolidated more power, do you see that? Do you see the prospects of, uh, of that happening? Yeah, uh, improving now. I think it can. I mean, it would require some new thinking on both sides. The Indian government surprised many when it announced last year during Prime Minister Modi's visit to China that it would now lift the existing political restrictions on Chinese investment. There were certain sensitive sectors of a strategic nature where Chinese investment was barred, ports, telecoms, and so on, and the government has opened up and said, come in, no problem. Uh, China hasn't yet taken the significantly, there are no major new projects announced, but if that happens, that could give China an important stake in the Indian economy, and of course, both countries are stake in each other's well-being. Mm. But secondly, I mean, uh, we were just talking off stage, as it were, about this string of pearls theory and so on. I've been quite you don't unwilling. That? I've been quite unwilling to be seduced by any arguments of some fundamental um, Chinese desire to strangulate India. First of all, like that old line in World War II about the chicken's neck, and the guy said, some chicken, some neck. It would, the Indian neck is not going to be strangled so easily by Chinese pearls scattered across the Indian Ocean, <laughs> I assure you. But I don't think the Chinese believe they can do it or would want to do it. And if you look, for example, at the Indian Ocean specifically, 
we actually have completely compatible interests. We both want to see the sea lanes of communication open, open okay. in both directions, from the Gulf in East Africa to India and on past us through the Straits and into China, into the South China Sea, mm. and of course in reverse. Mm. That flow of traffic helps India, India's growth, Indian goods, Indian oil security, energy security that works, and it helps China too. Okay. Why would it be in China's interest to interdite shipping in the Arabian Sea? It would actually hurt China, and the same with, with India. So, I don't see why we can't sit. I would have liked to have seen, for example, joint patrols against Somali pirates. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Indian and Chinese navies, instead of doing war games or exercises, worrying about each other, attacking each other, could actually cooperate in a shared interest? I think we now need to start thinking out of the box in both countries. Cooperation is possible. On global issues, uh, we have comparable stakes in the preservation of the global commons. India has been ahead of China in its active involvement in the UN and multilateral institutions. China is catching up very well. And I think there's a lot that they can do together without necessarily seeing a competition. India supported China on the realignment of the Bretton Woods weighted voting numbers. Mm -hmm. We felt it was absurd that China should have the same weighting voters weighted vote as Belgium. You know, mm. this, this is something we, 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 we are willing to make common cause with China on. Equally, it seems to me that we can't make common cause on something like cybersecurity. Mm. China is still a, a communist system with a top-down system. Ours is a democracy. We believe in a multi-stakeholder internet. So we're not going to be agreeing on every issue, but there are common issues in which we can cooperate. And I don't believe that this needs to be a conflict or a competition all the okay, time. Okay, fair enough. Let's open it up to the floor. Questions, anybody? Just raise your hands. A microphone will come to you. Just please uh, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and uh, where you're from or who, or who you represent. There's got to be at least a couple. Come on, don't be shy. You're doing such a good job with the questions. <laughs> I want to leave it to you. Hardly. Come on, let's have some fun. No questions? I don't, I don't believe it. Not even one? We haven't All you have to do is, is this is how people used to interact, you know, pre-internet. If anybody there, remembers, anyway. Right? Okay, I tell you what, uh, we do actually have a lot of questions coming in on this iPad here, so let's uh, get to at least some of them. And this one would probably be for Martin here. How can China be number one? And I like this one because uh, we talk about it every day. If the moment the average Chinese becomes rich and successful. They send their children and capital overseas. This is somewhat less true about India, although a similar phenomenon exists there as well. This is, understandably so, from Anonymous. Uh, well, not, not the hacking group, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, the phenomenon is, 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 is clearly uh, true up to a point. I mean, it, and it attracts a lot of attention. I mean, I'd be cautious about what proportion of people uh, do this. Certainly, when it comes to education, uh, the better off Chinese uh, quite like sending their kids to university in the US and the UK, uh, and now some European countries as well, but there's more of a language problem for that. Why do they do that? Um, well, I think that they, they think it'll give their kids uh, an advantage. Although still, of course, the great competition in China is to get to the top universities like Tsinghua, Peking, Fudan University, and so on. Doesn't it say, though, that they don't rate their own system, they don't believe in it, they don't trust their own system? And no, so I how think can China I, I, be number look, one? Look, um, I think it's if you can do it, um, and you, the kids want to do it, um, and they feel it's going to advance their interests, then, um, uh, you know, why not is probably the attitude. I mean, you know, let's be honest about it. My son has just got uh, a place at Stanford in the States. Why isn't he going to a UK university? Well, it, actually, he was the driver of this, not me. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's an international phenomenon and the Chinese, as they integrate with the world, will display some of the characteristics that we see or, you know, in the West. In terms of their capital, well, clearly there are some Chinese who get it out because they are worried about arbitrary regulations and so on being introduced by the government and they think that if they put the money abroad, it's going to be safer. But, um, uh, but it's, it, it, it's still a, pretty, a, a fairly limited phenomenon, but it could become bigger. It okay. could become bigger. All right, I've been told in very large type that there is a question in the back of the room. So if you could raise your hand and let us know where you are, 
I can't see it just yet. Am I misinformed? Ah, there. Please, sir. Or yes. This Please go ahead. Is, this question is for Dr. Sashi. Uh, sir, what is your assessment of Mr. Modi's government so far? Can you mean you in have relation your answer to China? Professional. <laughs> Do you mean in relation to China or in relation no, no, to? In gen general. In general. general. Okay, well, it's probably beside the, the point here, but I mean, very simply, um, I think Mr. Modi um, has delivered a series of very impressive speeches, but they haven't been accompanied <laughs> by sufficiently credible action on the ground. And um, uh, in other words, uh, there, there's a good diagnosis of what ails India and, and a lot of energy behind depicting that. We still need to see transformational actions by the government that would put India on the right path. Um, despite that, India is the largest, fastest growing major economy in the world. So uh, the fundamentals are there, but the things the government can do to make that much better and improve, and, and improve it, uh, that the government hasn't yet done. Okay. Any uh, other questions from the floor? If not, there is one here that is screaming to be asked. This is, uh, okay, someone who has identified himself, David Chu, and this one would be for you, Martin, as well. Uh, and I like this. Can China rule, basically deliver what you're uh, saying will happen in your book, can China rule without the RMB, the Chinese currency, being the dominant currency of trade and financial exchange? Is that almost a given? It has to happen if China is going to rule. Well, I think the, the simple answer is no that China cannot become the predominant economic power in the world unless it's also the predominant financial power. And that requires the renminbi to be fully convertible, open capital markets, and to be the preferred currency of choice as a reserve currency. That would be necessary, in my view, for that. How soon and do that, you think? Well, I, my view on this is um, slowly, slowly. You know, because I think that the Chinese economy is still, you know, uh, adolescent, uh, ill-balanced, um, still, you know, as we can see now, this period of reform is going to be very difficult to negotiate. So in that situation, the Chinese need to, for example, maintain significant capital controls. You know, the recent business in the renminbi, and the renminbi has been, as we know, appreciating against the dollar between uh, 2006 and, uh, uh, and last year, the renminbi appreciated by 20% against the US dollar. But then when people began to get worried that it, that, that was coming to an end, um, there was a, you know, a minor run on the renminbi. And as a result of that, they had to spend quite a lot of their, you know, what was it, a quarter? quarter of their um, uh, currency reserves on, on, on holding the value of the renminbi. Waste of money, waste of money, really, at this stage. What the, China, the Chinese should have maintained, I think, more stringent capital controls to, to prevent that. What they should do, though, is to, uh, in, in my view, they should allow the currency to float. Probably, that would probably be the best bet. But anyway, they haven't done that yet, they're, but they're, they're still clearly trying to work out uh, how to handle this situation. In the longer run though, in the longer run, because I think the question is directed in the longer run, the longer run the renminbi will become convertible and the renminbi will become the dominant currency. Okay. I mean, the, the Bloomberg figures, by the way, that you quoted, I think are wrong. On, it says that by 2030, the Chinese economy, uh, the, 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 the Chinese economy and the Indian economy combined will be larger than the America, twice as twice the size of the American economy. Actually, the figures, the, the more representative figures, are that the Chinese economy, will, on its own, will be twice the size of the American economy by 2030. That is only what uh, uh, 16 years, 14, whatever it is, 14, years 14 15 yeah. years uh, away. By that time, the renminbi sure a safer will sure be the dominant currency. That's 14 years away. In nearer term, though, I was going to ask you, Martin, whether you're one of these people who believe there is a big one-off devaluation of the renminbi coming. But actually, I'm going to ask Sashi because you know there is very little direct export competition between the two. So would it really matter if we had a big one-off devaluation of the renminbi to India? 
Well, at the moment, the terms of trade between India and China are so bad in terms of India's, from India's point of view, there's so much to India's disadvantage. Um, we've had, uh, to begin with, a, a massive trade imbalance throughout the growth period. The trade's now at about $70 billion, but about $60 billion of that is Chinese goods being sold to India. There's practically nothing the Chinese are buying from India, mm -hmm. and that's become a real issue. It's not the value of the RMB that, but much more the Chinese disinterest in Indian products. They were buying raw materials when they were growing, uh, almost colonial terms of trade, but now the raw materials are of less interest to them. They don't need iron ore and they don't need coal and they need all these things because they're not manufacturing as much as they used to. And the second problem is the things we do want to sell them, like pharmaceuticals. There are various non-tariff trade barriers that's making it impossible for us to break into the Chinese market. Because they're protecting their so, own pharma? So there, there are huge frustrations. I mean, for us, the value of the RMB is the least of our problems. It's about actually being able to sell our goods in China okay. at whatever price is reasonable for the Chinese to pay for them. And at the same time, we haven't been tough on the Chinese goods coming into India, which have wiped out many industries. I mean, uh, a 2,000-year-old in in Indian industry of natural dyes has been wiped out by Chinese chemical dyes completely. You know, nothing, you can't buy an Indian dye anymore in India. Uh, toys. Even our Hindu gods are being manufactured in China now. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is, this is extraordinary. <laughs> but in turn, they need to lift some barriers and let India into their market as well. Okay, this and question, that's very important. So actually, this question has to be for you as well. Uh, this is from, from David Chu again. Thank you, David. Uh, what will it take for India to consistently achieve the kind of economic growth rates China has enjoyed in the last three, four decades? What will it take? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take India since becoming Chinese, so that's not going to happen. Uh, but you know, we have a lot of good things going for us, and amongst the things we have going for us are uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the Indian people. There's an old joke that uh, the Indian economy grows at night when the government is asleep. That unlike China, it's not government-led growth, it's entirely private initiative-led growth, and I think that's largely true. Um, uh, we have uh, first-class entrepreneurs who've not only in the diaspora, but at home. We have people who have uh, uh, established themselves a tremendous track record of management, world-class companies coming out of India, not something the Chinese can say yet. Mm. There aren't Chinese equivalents to Tata's or Infosys or Wipro or whatever. Uh, India has also taken FDI outside, so that, for example, the Tata's have turned around Jaguar Land Rover. They didn't succeed with British Steel, but they, they, they did get uh, Jaguar Land Rover into the, into the, into the black, and it's doing very well, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, there's tremendous uh, energy out there, there's talent, there's a huge, huge um, domestic market which has been functioning, domestic consumptions out. I, I do feel that the fundamentals are there to take India forward. I don't think we're going to grow at 10% as China did, but I think we can sustain 7 to 8% over the next 20 years and get to numbers which are credible. Already in PPP terms, we are the third largest economy in the world. We've overtaken Japan. Uh, and in, in exchange rate terms, uh, we could draw level with the US around 2050 mm. to be second to China. That's, that's the, those are the projections by Goldman yeah, Sachs. That, that's others. not a bad place to and be it's, either. It's yeah. entirely, entirely feasible. The challenge is, of course, for us that we have this huge, huge um, opportunity, which is also potentially a disaster, and that's demography. 65% mm. of our population is under 35, 50.1% under 25. Uh, the, the, the people who are ready to start work are all in India. Now, the ILO says that we've got 116 million people between the ages of 20 and 24 in the year 2020. China will only have 94 million at the same time. This is such a we thing. could be the dynamic sort of workforce for the world. Right. We have so to train the, them, equip them. We have to have an infrastructure and a manufacturing industry to absorb them. Final thought. Would it, be fair, to, would it be fair to say, unlike, let's say, China, in India, if you're not able to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, maximize this dem demographic dividend, right? You have... Uh, a lot of people without jobs. You cannot, the government cannot deliver. The, the difference with, with China is you will not have so much a revolution, you'll just have a different government. Yeah, we just keep changing governments and elections. <laughs> Though, in fact, in fact, right now we have a government with a secure majority for five years. Would have been a great opportunity to do more than they have done. They've allowed themselves to answer that question more fully, uh, to be distracted by unnecessary issues, cultural issues of religious chauvinism and so on, which have needlessly distracted the government and the nation from the real agenda of economic growth and transformation, where they would have found people willing to back them across the spectrum. 
That's one thing where the Chinese system, uh, because of its rather rigorous control, uh, has been able uh, to, to avoid. There has been a single-minded focus on getting rich. And I think that is the real answer to your question. That's what it would take to make India grow like China, is if we can focus single-mindedly okay. on getting rich. <laughs> oh, okay. I think uh, many people would agree Maybe with we're not capable on, of on that. that. Now, I'm going to get spanked by our Credit Suisse minders, but I'm really just, just too tempted I have to ask this question. This is from, uh, let's see here, Raj uh, Chitrani. And I assume this would be for uh, Sashi, although Martin can have a crack at this too. Uh, Raj is asking, to what extent do caste and communal differences hinder India from realizing its true potential? Does the fact that China is culturally more homogenous than India give China a very strong edge? Sashi, first go. Well, yes, we have all these differences, but the great strength of India has been it's been an outstanding example of the management of diversity in the developing world. Fact is, many societies have that diversity. As I said, the Africans look at us and they see many similarities. The question is, how do you manage that? Is it always going to be a source of conflict? When conflict erupts, are you able to defuse the conflict effectively? And through our democracy and our system, we have been able to do that. I think one of the great unsung accomplishments of 70 years of Indian democracy, look back at articles in the 1950s and 60s predicting India's imminent disintegration. The London Times and places like that, Neville Maxwell, a big China fan, mm. wrote articles saying, this is going to be India's last election, he wrote in 1967. Well, there have been a dozen more since. The fact is that people didn't see how India would hang together, but India managed the difficult art of saying, you can be divided by caste, creed, color, culture, conviction, cuisine, custom, and costume, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus in a democracy like India is on the fundamental principle, which China doesn't have, that you don't need to agree all the time, mm. so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. Mm. So our success is that we manage to maintain consensus on how to manage without consensus. Can China do that the day the consensus disappears? Uh, Can uh, it? I, I think China, China is a fascinating uh, country in this sense. There it is, a fifth of the world's population. The longest continuous existing policy in the world, as I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the map, what happened to all the old empires? All the old empires have disappeared. And there's China, which started off as an empire, and it's still there. Now, how is it still there? What's the key? What, I think there is one key factor behind the fact that China still enjoys this sort of cohesion. It is? It is that. China consisted of a multitude, historically, of many different races and ethnicities. And yet, over time, the process of Hanization, that is, people regarding themselves to be Han, which has become not quite, but almost synonymous with being Chinese, was a remarkably successful process. It's taken 2,000 years. But if you look at the population surveys now, over 94% of Chinese think of themselves as Han. That is an extraordinary fact. And I think that underlying China's, uh, uh, the fact that the century, the century petal forces that hold China together are generally, but not always, stronger than the centrifugal forces, is for this reason. How concerned are you about this? And the, the opposite, that is, I was going to bring up, say, Muslims in Xinjiang, mm -hmm. Tibetans. But look, but you see, yeah, of course, the, of course there's a problem. But look, the fact is that there are 20 million people in Xinjiang province, which is a huge, geographically huge, but largely uninhabitable. 10 million of them are Uyghur, are Muslim. Just 10 million people. Or if you look at Tibet, very, you know, what's the population of Tibet? Under five, six million, plus the people who live in Sichuan and so on. They're very small relative to the total population of China. I'm not getting into, involved in, do the Chinese handle these problems rightly? In many ways, I don't think they do. Okay. But they are tiny compared with what we're talking about, right. which is 1.4 billion people. And this is the key to understanding China. 
Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've got all three screens here screaming at me to wrap up. <laughs> I wish we had more time. This is very interesting, exciting, even for me. So uh, thank you to both you. Martin as well as Sashi and to you for joining us this afternoon. Hope to see you again uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you.